Hello, everyone. Welcome to this panel discussion on Indigenous Intellectual Property Comparative Perspectives. We will be starting shortly. This is organized by the Indigenous Studies Discussion Group, which is a graduate student-led initiative at the University of Cambridge. We started in 2019 with the objective of providing a platform for discussing issues affecting Indigenous peoples across disciplines, times, and geographies. We are kindly supported by the Cambridge Heritage Research Center. This is the second event that we are hosting this week. As many of you will know that this is a significant week for indigenous peoples in different parts of the world. In the United States, this is, this is the week that has indigenous peoples day. And in India, this is a landmark anniversary for the Criminal Tribes Act. To know more about our upcoming events and give us feedbacks and suggestions for the future, uh, do reach out to us on our social media accounts, to which uh, we will sort of post the links uh, very soon. Uh, today's panel was to be chaired by Ananya Mishra, who is a PhD student at the Faculty of English and studies comparative indigenous literatures. Unfortunately, because of issues around connectivity, uh, this has prevented her from chairing it. So the honor of chairing the session is on me today. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce our discussions for today. Uh, they are Dr. Charles Akwe Masango, who is a traditional knowledge researcher at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. We have Rhonda Levaldo, who's a professor of media communications at the Haskell Indian National University in Lawrence, Kansas in the United States. And Dr. Madan Mina, who is a practicing artist, a researcher, and the honorary director of the Adivasi Academy in Tejgad, Gujarat in India. So many thanks to our panelists for taking the time out from their schedules to make this event and to the audience for joining in. The format for the event would be that each panel will uh, each panelist will have around 15 minutes to speak. Once all the speakers have finished, we will be taking questions from the audience. Throughout the course of the, uh, the uh, speeches, you will be able to ask questions in the ask questions button below. You can also upvote questions that other audience members may have asked. So without much further ado, I would invite Dr. Charles Masango uh, to speak. Just before he speaks, uh, I will uh, have to take the other panelists off screen. So I hope you will rejoin us uh, very soon. And yes, so Charles, you are on screen. Uh, so just a little bit about Charles. So. Uh, he is presently the research development coordinator with the Emerging Researcher Program at the Department of Research and Innovation at the University of Cape Town and is a South African National Research Foundation rated researcher. He has a PhD specializing in contemporary copyright fair dealing management issues and has a law degree from the University of Yaoundé in Cameroon and a postgraduate diploma in library information sciences from the University of Botswana and a master's uh, in the same field from the University of Cape Town. Cape Town is where he is based at the moment and also where he did his PhD. And uh, he's taught at the same department in Cape Town and at the University of Fort Hare in South Africa uh, prior to his appointment to the University of Cape Town. He's published several papers and review articles in local and international peer reviewed journals addressing issues related to indigenous and traditional knowledge and medicine. So with this introduction, uh, welcome to the panel and the floor is yours, Charles. Well, thanks very much for giving me this opportunity to share ideas and thoughts on in indigenous intellectual property. I'll start by saying what I think is indigenous intellectual property. This is an umbrella legal term 
used in national and international charts to identify indigenous peoples' claims of collective intellectual property rights to protect specific local knowledge that is unique to a culture or society. Having said this, why, or we always said, what is the raison d'etre for the protection of indigenous intellectual property? You will agree with me that this knowledge has to be protected because it is being exploited by appropriation for financial gains by third parties. Furthermore, private or to prevent drug industries who use this knowledge for financial benefits without giving it back to those who really own it. Another reason that I came up with was that Western science has recently begun looking at indigenous knowledge as a source of new drugs, yet refusing to acknowledge its economic value and ownership. Furthermore, this knowledge needs to be protected because indigenous medicine, for example, plays an important role in developed countries where the demand for herbal medicine is growing. Again, a reason for its protection is that Western science makes a lot of money from medicinal plants without the consent of the possessors of the resources and knowledge. One would say that this knowledge needs to be protected to allow developing countries to benefit from the large sums of money that developed countries derive from herbal drugs that are made out of developing countries medicinal plants again following that a large number of patients has been granted i mean patents here on generic resources and knowledge obtained from developing countries without further improvement is a reason that i believe this should be prevented or protected. But now, when we talk of protecting indigenous intellectual property, what are the main challenges? We have challenges here. And the main challenge I say here is that protecting indigenous people's knowledge and cultural expression is the main challenge. This is because indigenous intellectual property encompass esoteric as well as non-esoteric epistemology. What day are these esoteric aspects that needs to be protected or that are already protected? These are big myths, traditional beliefs, superstition, stories and customs. These are secrets and are not in the public domain. On the other hand, the non esoteric aspects are those that are in the public domain and they include specific plants, identification of medicinal properties in plants, and harvesting practices. 
if we say we should be protecting indigenous intellectual property and we've got esoteric aspects that are already protected how then do we think we can protect this knowledge in most of my writings for those of you who will have the time to go through some of what i have published you'll be able to see that this is really the main points that i always try to stress on so i say here why the esoteric aspects of indigenous intellectual property may not be exposed for protection one of the reasons that i've come up with is that it may not be ex exposed for protection because they embrace spiritual elements that are considered a secret also the element the esoteric elements may not be protected or be exposed for protection because traditional healers hand down part of the knowledge by word of mouth this is a rhetoric element again may not be exposed for protection because it is already protected within traditional circles as it is a source of livelihood to traditional healers furthermore not meant for protection because traditional healers cannot reveal the secret elements for fear of being killed by the supernatural creature we go forward by thinking or saying that these esoteric elements cannot be exposed because it is not revealed to non practitioners for fear that it may be stolen and exploited without the consent of the possessors of the resources and knowledge again following that low, the low level of education of the practitioners of the medicine is another way that inhibits its protection because they feel that they are not going to be looked upon if at all they put forward this is the toric elements again they consider that this is the toric elements are already protected and they don't need any external protection but having seen why some of these is the toric elements cannot be protected how can we expect this to be exposed so that it is protected because when we look at the non esoteric aspects they are all in the public domain for the non esoteric and the esoteric aspects to be placed in the public domain for posterity i believe it is good for mankind I'll take a very good example here of recent we all have been suffering from the covid-19 pandemic the madagascan scientists came up with a tonic that they said could cure this covid-19 issue there was a very big problem with the world health organization because the madagascan scientists could only reveal 60% of these medicinal properties and they refused to reveal the other 40% had it been that they revealed the 40% maybe we couldn't have been where we are today digging more graves 
and missing so many important people in the world. Hence, I believe there should be a way that these esoteric elements can be put in the public domain for our pharmaceutical industries to at least benefit from it and make it public to mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll leave it there. And hopefully, I'm hoping that during the talk, we're going to open up more worms that could not be opened up in the little chat that I've been able to give to you today. Unfortunately, I couldn't prepare slides because I thought that most of my publications are out there. And for those who are interested, they can go in there, read more. And if they have any challenges, my emails are there. They can write to me so that we break even and see how we can put forth our efforts for mankind. Thanks very much. And I'm waiting to hear what we've got in the discussion. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Charles, for your presentation and so presenting the rationale for protecting indigenous intellectual property and the tensions that a conventional sort of approach to indigenous uh, to intellectual property uh, provides when put in the indigenous context. Uh, I do hope we sort of do get more questions and an opportunity to discuss that as we go forward. And uh, I would request participants to post questions if they have any in the ask questions box below. And uh, we, will, we will post a link to Charles's uh, publications very soon. Uh, I would now introduce and invite onto screen our next speaker, who is Rhonda Livaldo. Uh, Rhonda is a professor of media communications at the Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas. She has also helped start Not In Our Honor, a group that is calling for the Kansas City football team to change its name. Rhonda is the host for the Native Spirit Radio on KKFI in Kansas City, which airs every Sunday. She also freelances for the National Native News, which is a radio program that airs on public radio across the country, and is also a member of the Board of Directors for Indian Country Today. Uh, Rhonda is also a past president of the Native American Journalists Association. Uh, so with this introduction, Rhonda, uh, welcome to the panel, and we'll hand it over to you. Uh, let me just bring you up on screen. Hello. Oh, yeah. And uh, we have the presentation that you have sent us. Just let me try and also just put that up. Okay. So I was going to be talking about um, the examples of um, what we consider cultural appropriation of our uh, native art and music as well. And so just wanted to give some examples of some of what has happened before. And so in this first slide, we have uh, examples of uh, cultural appropriation. And we had a group that was selling what they termed Navajo jewelry that was made in the Philippines. And they actually were, um, um, arrested and then and charged with this crime. It is a crime. It's a um, crime what they consider the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990. And so uh, they were charged with this and um, had to pay significant fines. But there's also other examples where different fashion houses use that term Navajo. And so there's another uh, screenshot of a uh, of a tweet of the house of St. Laurent uh, marketing a Navajo necklace. And of course it was not made by any native person, but it was made in Italy. And so, you know, they were charged as well under the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. Um, 
there's another, so the, the next slide, I just wanted to give the term, I know it's a lot of um, words on a screen, but it was just the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990. If you want to go to the second slide and what that um, exactly entails. And so uh, that is uh, basically prohibiting misrepresentation of marking of Indian arts and crafts products within the United States. So this is just within the United States. It's not um, uh, worldwide. It is illegal to offer a display for sale or sell any art or craft product in a manner that falsely suggests that it is Indian produced or an Indian product or the product of a particular Indian or Indian tribe or Indian arts and crafts organization resident within the United States. Uh, so they have the first time violation. An individual can face civil or criminal penalties up to a $250,000 fine or a five-year prison term or both. And then a business, if they violate the act, can face civil penalties and can be prosecuted and fined up to a million dollars. So under this act, uh, they define Indian as a member of a federally or officially state recognized tribe of the United States or an individual certifies as an Indian artisan by an Indian tribe. This covers all Indian and Indian style traditional contemporary arts and crafts acts produced after 1934. And it's broadly applied uh, to the marketing of arts and crafts by any person in the United States. And so, uh, some traditional items copied by non-natives uh, non include jewelry. Of course, I showed you the example of the jewelry, uh, pottery, baskets, uh, stone fetishes, rugs, kachina dolls, and clothing. And so they want to make sure when these products are produced that they are including native people um, in their designs. And unfortunately, what happens is um, it's become fashionable to have this uh, southwestern motif in their clothing style. And so a lot of times when people don't realize uh, what they're doing is stealing designs that Native people have owned or, you know, within a family have owned and, and used for their own, um, you know, artwork that they use. So if you want to go to the next slide, uh, there was just another example um, of, a, of, of someone um, using this. And this was Urban Outfitters. And they were marketing, um, unfortunately, it was underwear and a flask, of all things, um, as Navajo. They were just terming it broadly, loosely, again, as Navajo. And the Navajo Nation uh, went after them and sued them uh, to get rid of this. And, of course, uh, as well to um, have, have uh, alcohol uh, involved in this kind of was an, an odd situation um, to do this as well. And as a person who does music, um, my radio show, I, for myself, I try to uh, make sure that uh, Native Americans who are in the musical industry uh, get heard and get seen, um, you know, wherever they can. And especially within uh, the mainstream music system that we have in radio, there's not many places that our people can get this visibility. So I feel like it's my duty to go out and, and help them get seen. Unfortunately, uh, there's also uh, incidences of people um, marketing themselves as Native American uh, musicians, and they're not. And so uh, this goes out to music as well. So those are the end of my slides. Um, so for example, uh, in Kansas City, we had a, a gentleman who was uh, named Terry Lee Whetstone. And he was selling um, his own artwork. He was performing as a Native American flute player. And I know a lot of people have seen uh, Native American flute players out there. And he was going out and doing these presentations as a Native American flute player. And, you know, it's a, you can get paid pretty well for doing this. And so he was doing these performances and he was not uh, Native American. And he was... Uh, again, sued under the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. And so now uh, he, still, he still plays the flute. Um, he has a website, you can look him up. Uh, but what he has to do is before he does a performance, he has to tell people that he is not Native American. And a lot of times uh, people don't understand this or why he's saying that, um, and they still hire him anyway. And for myself who is trying to help people um, 
make a living as a musician, that's a really a slap in the face to all those other Native Americans that are out there, um, you know, trying to do the same thing. And so uh, I try and make sure people understand when I'm playing music on my show, I really go out and vet people to make sure that they are Native American, that they are um, from a, a certain tribe or whatever they're saying they are, um, because I want to make sure, you know, I'm not having um, frauds on my show. So um, it's not only with arts, but it's also with music. And again, with the clothing style that we see um, people wearing. And so um, like the first presenter was talking about, you know, why is this important? You know, because our people have been doing this for, for a very long time and for them to be copied and, um, you know, people misusing their artwork is a travesty. Uh, I know there was another example and I couldn't find it, but it was a Alaskan native who had a design uh, that was stolen from a very old art piece and it was being used by a fashion house uh, for, I think it was for a jacket. And they, they were very devastated by having this artwork put out there. So it, you know, some of the stuff is very personal to native people as well um, because it goes back so many years and, you know, just people don't realize the importance that certain artwork has. Yes, it may look pretty, but there's a story behind that. And there's a reason you have it out there. Um, for myself, I'm from Acoma Pueblo and we have, uh, we're known for making pottery and our designs, usually those designs go and they're being passed through families uh, for, for many years. And there's stories behind that. And there's certain artwork that you're supposed to use for certain things. And we can't always tell that story to regular non acomas or non Pueblo people because it's only supposed to stay uh, within your people. And I think sometimes a lot of people get curious about um, our stories and they want to hear that. But when you do that, that's how it gets misused and gets put out there. Um, unfortunately, because uh, powwow, uh, even powwow dancing, powwow regalia has gotten out there through YouTube, uh, we have people that are making up their own outfits and pretending to be Native Americans um, all, all over the place. In, in Germany, it's very rampant uh, where they've learned how to do the dances. They've learned how to do the beadwork, but they don't understand those stories behind what they're doing and that you're not supposed to be doing certain things outside of your tribal homelands. And so um, I think it's important that people realize that um, you know, with the things that we have as Native people, um, sometimes we can't answer all those questions on certain things, but to understand the importance that it is and it holds um, and to be respectful of that and to understand that why we can't say certain things. So um, I would appreciate any questions um, that you guys have of Native people. I don't know if I'll be able to answer all of them because I only speak for uh, my people, my Akuma people, but um, I'm very glad to be here and, and, and talking about this. Well, thank you so much, Rhonda, for that very, very insightful presentation. And uh, just in the discussion box, I'm posting some links to the work that Rhonda does and also her Twitter account. Um, and yes, thank, thank you so much for like taking us through issues of appropriation of identity and how material objects often have cultural histories and stories associated with them. And I hope we will sort of get to speak a little bit more about it in the discussion that follows. Uh, let me now take this opportunity to invite our last speaker on uh, the panel to, onto the screen. Uh, let me just introduce our speaker. So, uh, Dr. Madan Meena is a visual artist and a researcher who has worked extensively with artists and craftspersons from local communities in Rajasthan and Gujarat in India. 
His doctoral work was on wall paintings done by women of the Mina tribe. He has exhibited their work across uh, the country and abroad, and has also published two books titled The Joy of Creativity and Nurturing Walls. As curator of the Rupayan Sanstan in Jodhpur, India, he designed an exhibition on brooms for the Arna Jharna Museum and was also associate director of a film called Jharu Katha on the same subject. Madan has been regularly recording oral traditions amongst nomadic, agrarian and hereditary musician communities. And his major work is on the Tejaji ballad sung widely across Rajasthan. At present, Madan is honorary director of the Adivasi Academy, which is situated in Eastern Gujarat, where he is trying to restore sustainable models amongst indigenous communities. Uh, we are fortunate that Madan has previously also appeared on a panel with the Indigenous uh, Studies Discussion Group on the impact of COVID-19 on indigenous peoples in India. And with this, we welcome you back to this forum and the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Nishant. Thank you very much for bringing me back to this stage. And it was wonderful <clears throat> listening to Charles and Rhonda. And as Rhonda said uh, about these designs being stolen by other people, similarly, there are many cases. Uh, I, I come from Rajasthan, so Rajasthan is a hub of many crafts and uh, practiced by many ethnic communities, actually. But most of these craft in the in the recent years has been stolen by uh, designers or by the big brands actually. So that has been a subject of my study also. But over here, I would like to present something on oral traditions, uh, which is very close to me and three oral traditions which I have studied. And I'm happy that Nishant has mentioned about the denotified tribes and the nomadic tribes. Uh, India has completed, it's completing 150 years of this Criminal Tribe Act, which was uh, uh, constituted in 1871 <clears throat> on 12th of October, just two days before. So on that occasion, I chose to spoke about two uh, nomadic uh, communities. And one is about the agrarian community. And you will see how a shift is happening and how the commercialization of these uh, traditions is happening, which is worldwide, actually. I, I, it is not just a case of India, but you can all connect with that. The same situation must be in your area also. So I'm just sharing my slides, uh, which has some video clips, basically. I think the videos are enough to speak about themselves. So, uh, Nishant, can you allow me? Uh, yes, if you hover above uh, your screen, you should have a share screen option. Uh, says that a stream is limited to four simultaneous video sources. Oh, right, right. So, sorry, we'll have to ask one of our panelists to uh, leave and we'll add them back. One second. Uh, you should be able to share it now, sir. Uh, so, let me just. Sharing my screen, so let me go. Are you able to see my screen now, Nishant? Nishant, Nishant yeah. are you able to? Yeah. Huh? We are able to see it. Go, go ahead. Okay, fine. So, so this is about uh, my subject. Actually, the art form is celebrated. Uh, but not the communities who are practicing it because that art form has been dominated it has been taken over by other dominant communities so in that perspective i'm just talking about these performing art and oral tradition and these three of them uh, are two are from rajasthan and one is from madhya pradesh which is just an adjacent state to rajasthan every one of you must be knowing about this famous uh, kalbelia folk, folk songs and dances of rajasthan and it has been listed by UNESCO also under the, this intangible cultural heritage section. And the community is popularly known from the, for this dance form. It's a nomadic community uh, that comes from uh, west of Rajasthan. And they are spread across uh, North India. Uh, so there is a small sample. Uh, this is a dance form. Let me see if this video can play. One second. So this is a small clip from a film Lacho Drome, which is about the uh, the gypsies of the West and uh, the nomadic tribes from Rajasthan who, who are associated with this uh, 
performing art. Let me see if this video can play. I think the video has a problem. So, <clears throat> so this is one such dance dance form which has become internationally popular. It has been even taken over taken away by the some of the foreign performers also. And uh, the, yeah, the sample is playing. You can just see uh, <clears throat> what kind of a dance form it is. Yeah, so uh, that is one. Uh, one so that is one. Uh, this performing arts of the Kalbelia, the nomadic community, and they became popular when in 1970s and 80s these India festivals abroad started happening. So uh, the, these communities were for the first time they were taken abroad. Uh, they participated in, uh, in Moscow, in in France, even in Europe also. And since then, this has caught attention of the world, and I think this is the only one art form from Rajasthan which has uh, which has been recognized by UNESCO. So this is nice, but the sad story uh, of this dance form is that there are only few Kalbelia dancers, and uh, there are more non Kalbelia dancers. Or they are uh, there are more of non Indian dancers which who has taken over this dance form, and they uh, perform everywhere now. Uh, they have become more popular than the traditional Kalbelia dance performers. And even those Kalbelia women who go and abroad who perform this, they have a story of exploitation. So this is a voice from the community member who is a community leader of the Kalbelia community. So just listen to his voice. I've just tried to record him and he has revealed some of the very striking points about, about the community.
So this is a story of exploitation, uh, the one of the <coughs> performing art form that that became so popular that it was recognized even by the UNESCO. But the ground realities are totally different. The community has never actually improved in any of their financial conditions. Their, their lived realities are entirely different than what we see in this vibrant uh, dance form. So this is one case of the Kalbelia women dancers. Now I'm going to present another. Uh, this is about a, a religious faith. It's about a, a, a ballad uh, which is sung uh, in memory of a snake deity. Uh, he was born in 14th century and he's revered by most of the Agrigan communities because they encounter the snake bites. So the uh, deities worship uh, with the belief that uh, they will be saved from snake poisoning. So uh, night jagrans are organized mostly during the monsoon when most of these snakes are encountered in these communities. So there is a small clip how, how this original form of these night jagrans happens actually in their traditional form. So you can see this is a small shrine. Most of these shrines are open shrines and you can see that the small sculpture of that of the deity it is here and the priest is standing on its side so this is uh, uh, th these are traditional temples of and over these traditional temples the night jagrans happen actually that means the night awakenings happen uh, during the month of monsoon so here is one small video uh, where the procession of the musicians is going through the street of a, of a village and this goes on like starts late night at 10 or 12 o'clock and goes on till morning so this is the original form of uh, of singing or of the of the of the night awakening that happened so just a small clip of it and then i'll see, show you in its contrast how it has been commercialized then. So I have been working with the tradition for last 15 years and uh, when I began my work, I saw such traditional performances happening throughout night in many of the villages in Rajasthan. But in recent years, what I have found that uh, because in the, even in the picture also you can see these are mostly aged men. So the many have passed away and then uh, it, uh, the whole stage has been taken over by the young generation who do not know to sing these ballads and they do not, they are not even interested to for this night awakening. So they have replaced it now completely and what with, with what they have replaced it is a very Bollywood style orchestra performances nowadays. So you'll just see a recent recent video from uh, from last year that I recorded and witnessed in a village and I was really surprised that this is happening in the in a religious space actually. It is happening in the in a temple of Tejaji. <laughs>
so in the in the video that you see the man with the turban dancing in the center he is a priest he is a main priest of the temple and he too is participating in it so this is a big intergenerational shift that is that has happened and it is very much inspired from the bollywood that we see or from the modern orchestra that we see so the religious belief has been replaced totally by these at least these i should say they are very much vulgar actually they, with the vulgar entertainment now coming to the third case is about a celebration of molestation actually it is not a celebration of a religious belief or it's not about about a belief for which this uh, this this uh, this place which is of kareli uh, kareli mata goddess which is in the madhya pradesh the belief about this uh, temple is this that uh, uh, if anyone make a wish for the male child and the male child is born or maybe a wish for any other matter if the, if the wish is fulfilled then the villagers come in groups and they commission these uh, women dancers who are from the uh, denotified tribe the bedia uh, bedia women so they come in groups they first take these women uh, uh, to to the temple where the woman has to perform actually this is a temple this is a shrine where you can see in the center sita uh, uh, rama's wife and then two of her sons and then the guru valmiki guru is there so the practice is this if a son is born then you have to bring these women uh, Uh, who who has to come and they have to dance uh, over here before the ideal and then after this this is a this is a practice but what happens after this is is entirely a different story actually these women are then after doing this small ceremony in the temple they are brought to the to the grounds actually of the and in the ground they assemble and not just one village they are there are hundreds of villages and there are hundreds of women who are brought here and then they dance with them and it's a, you will see a clear molestation that happens so it is just in the disguise of a religious belief actually uh, what happens behind the curtains so this is one example of that so this is a huge contrast to what the original traditions are meant for and then what they have become become right now we have lost most of oral traditions like this maybe because of the bollywood because of the new generation the new kind of education the new kind of exploitation that has taken place so kalbelia was an example of commercialization exploitation by the market where the middlemen are there who takes such huge commissions from these innocent dancers teja ji is a case <clears throat> where the, there is generational shift from religious belief to entertainment purely then bedia dancers the last video that i showed you is a molestation vulgarity under the curtains of popular religious practice so this is what i see happening with most of the indigenous knowledge systems uh, in the modern world and i think this is over nishan from my side thank you Right. Th thank you so much, uh, Madan, for the presentation and uh, for playing these clips, which uh, I, I think you have shot and are not very easily available. So, thank you for the sort of, uh, effort to get them and put them out. Uh, what I'm doing is also just sharing Madan's uh, bio and 
you can see some of his uh, former work, both artistic as well as literary, uh, which will be available here. Uh, so with this, I wanted to open the floor up to uh, our participants for questions. So thank you to all of the participants for taking the time out to come to this. Uh, let me just get all the participants back onto the screen. We do have a couple of questions uh, that have come into the question box. So if the speakers can already see them, uh, but if not, I'll read them out in a moment. And bring all the panelists back onto the screen. And so among the questions that we brought, so the one that seems to have been rated the most by other users is this, which is that can non-Indigenous scholars and more specifically white scholars uh, analyze or study other cultures without ethical power imbalances, without capitalizing and benefiting from others' cultures? So thank you for asking that. Would any of the panelists want to take a crack at this? Sorry, I didn't get the, I didn't get the question. Ah, right. Sorry. The question is: Can non-indigenous scholars and more specifically white scholars uh, study analyze other cultures without any ethical or power imbalances and without capitalizing or benefiting from the other cultures? I can answer this, uh, Nishant, if you would like me to answer this. Sure, sure. I mean, go ahead. Uh, see, I have seen uh, many good white scholars or, or maybe the non-Indigenous scholars who has done wonderful works. And I can name them actually over here because you are you are from Cambridge now. You see, John Smith has done a wonderful work on Pabuji's word actually. And he has brought that whole performance into the limelight on internationally actually. Then even Joe Miller has done a wonderful work on this Dave and uh, work. I have not seen such scholarly work done by any of the Indian Indian scholars so far. So I see that uh, it all depends on the commitment and all depends on the on the belief actually in that particular tradition. So it's not that uh, they have been misinterpreted always, uh, but they are good work that has been done by many of the white scholars and non-Indian or maybe the non-Indigenous scholars. Even we see, for example, Indian context, we remember work of this, uh, the British scholar uh, who worked with the Gondna, Nishan. Varier Elvin, Varier Elvin. I think if Varier Elvin has not worked on the Indian tribe, they would have never got, come into the limelight actually. They would have never found their representation in the, even in the constitution also. So it has been some important works done by the foreign scholars that has brought attention to these issues also. So to me, I I do not see much of the much of the spoilage actually uh, uh, with with such uh, indigenous traditions. But yeah, with the new crop of uh, uh, new crop of uh, what what should we say? Uh, this, for example, people who are exploiting them for commercial purpose, where there, there is commodification actually. There, the attempts are being done in a very wrong manner. Those should be objective. Uh, that is my understanding about it. So, I can, can I... So, I, I, so I was just going to say, um, you know, with native um, scholar works that we've had, um, as long as someone's an ally and, and willing to help out and expose information um, and get our work out there. I think um, we've had a problem with um, people who were not native pretending to be native and writing um, articles and writing books. And that's not seen as a uh, great thing to us because um, they tend to get outed, especially on the internet now. And so, yes, uh, as long as you're not making money off of it and, and again, leaving space for native people to you know, talk about things that are going on out there, I teach an American Indian music class, and a lot of the scholar um, stuff that I found um, to show to my students was written by uh, white people. And so 
um, they really talked about how this needs to change and there needs to be more scholarly work in regards to uh, historical perspectives of um, Native American music. So um, I welcome that. If they want to do that, that's great. Uh, but I thought it was just crazy that they're pointing this out, that all this work that was being done for that specific genre was being done by uh, non-natives. The short the short term research is has such problems actually, but the people who has engaged themselves throughout their life actually, like John Smith and I example that he has engaged his whole life into working on this one ballad from Rajasthan. So uh, we can't tell that this is a wrong interpretation. He has done a quite good work. But the new generation of scholars, like they come for a year or two and they just produce a work of, uh, of uh, academic of, or another important. Over there, there are chances of such mistakes happening, actually. But definitely, if the purpose is commercial, then there are a lot of problems with, the, with this. Uh, I agree with, uh, uh, with these things, uh, what, you are, you, what you mean, actually. Uh, sorry, sorry. Can I can I okay, yes, in here? Please go ahead. Now, when we talk of non-indigenous fellows benefiting from what really they don't really own, I think we should be looking at it in two perspectives. What really do they want to benefit from? what really can they tell that is truthful because i have been reading a lot of these publications being churned out i always say you can't say something that you don't know if you not, you are not in the inner core there are certain things that non-scholars can and there are others that they cannot. And that's why I said the most important protection is this esoteric epistemology. This is not in the public domain. How can we bring these esoteric aspects in the public domain so much that the community and the world benefits from it. I think that is the question. We know people are making money out of this. Yes, but they are making money out of what is already in the public domain. But the hidden aspect is what we don't know. And as social scientists, we should be looking forward to seeing how this esoteric aspect, these secret aspects can be brought to the fold. I think that is where the problem is. So, uh, thank you so much to all the panelists for really like jumping and providing so many different interesting perspectives because I think this, this is a question that does sort of come up very often and perhaps more in academic institutions where a lot of uh, the researchers are non-indigenous and it's a really important one to tackle. So thank you so much for your perspectives. Uh, there is another question that seems to be quite popular amongst the audience. And uh, so the question is this, that is there a balance that can be achieved in providing indigenous cultural knowledge to members of indigenous diasporas who are away from these centers of knowledge or away from their ancestral lands without the risk of this knowledge being misused or misappropriated? <laughs> Again, that is another big problem. And if at all, these indigenous fellows are refusing to tell the inner core of their knowledge, I think is one of those things because it might be misappropriated. If you go and see some of the papers I've written, I think I brought up this idea. You can't go in there or again, 
Wills J. did say, the thoughts of man are not tribal, for the devil himself knoweth not the thoughts of man. This is something you can't really say because you don't know once it's out there what people can do with it. So it's a problem that one can't say or can't come up with a conclusion. Thoughts of people are never known. So we can't really conclude there. That's what I think. Nishant, I have been actually, uh, uh, after finishing my, these documentations and recordings always, I have always been distributing these recordings back to the communities. Right, uh, right. Uh, I have been doing this actually practically in my life. Uh, but what I have seen, uh, I have seen both sides of it, uh, that they started using it uh, because uh, nowadays, as I said, that the old people are just passing away and enough night jagrans or night awakenings are not happening. So uh, what people will do that they will listen them on their mobile phones because they can just listen. These recordings are easily accessible. Now I give them in memory cards or earlier I was used to give them in CDs. So when the occasion comes, they would play, they would play them through the music systems and all that. But later on, what I found, this was a good thing that I found that at least they are having interest in this instead of playing some Bollywood music, they were at least playing those bhajans. But at the same time, what I saw that many people has misused those recordings and they have converted them into some music albums in, in tune with the Bollywood music, actually. So there's always a chance of its misuse also. Uh, that that happens actually once this material is out in others hand actually they know that they it has a commercial viability because if they are able to produce something like that then definitely they are going to earn out of it all so they are both things actually i have seen uh, there's there can't be any balance actually you have to counter this reality that is what i have experienced myself in my life and from a i would just say from a um native perspective to add to this uh, conversation of balance and misusing things that we've done can also be very um, harmful to oneself. So uh, for example, Native American church um, groups, you know, they use peyote um, in their ceremonies and it's a, it's sacred. It's, it's part of um, their ceremony, but because peyote has become this like uh, thing that um, people want to use, so they want to experience it and not realizing that the way that Native American church people use it is not the way that they're going to use it. And they're misusing that um, natural drug and you know they could potentially hurt themselves and that's not what it's supposed to be used for. So yes, you know, it's not even just um, misusing it for oneself, but also you could, you know, hurt yourself in some of these situations. Right. I, thank you. So that I think is a very sort of interesting take, but I was also wondering how sort of one can use this uh, research as an educational tool, because often these are oral traditions and documenting in itself may perhaps change the nature of this knowledge. So would, would you think that it's sort of beneficial to uh, use research that's done as an educational tool for, for the community? I think so, yeah. So, I mean, you know, people can, um, you know, research our native traditions and stuff that's out there. Um, interesting though, in the ethnography that was done um, a long time ago, uh, when people thought Native Americans were dying out, uh, those ethnographers that were put in um, tribal spaces, you know, they weren't getting all the information. Yeah, they were writing it down, but they may not have gotten all the perfect information because uh, the communities they were in were not willing to disclose everything to them. So there might be some problems <laughs> in some of that research. But uh, for the most part, you know, I, I think it's great that people want to learn about uh, Native American culture, but make sure that you're doing it correctly and that, um, you know, whatever you get out of it, again, that you're not misusing or 
misappropriating uh, that information that you received. Right, thank you. Uh, we have another question. So uh, it it goes like this. So it says, who are the people interested in translating indigenous knowledges into the category of intellectual property? What other categories could be subsumed into intellectual property? And what could be the diverse motivations of indigenous peoples in protecting their intellectual property? So actually, a couple of questions in, in the guise of one question. Somebody else want to take that? <laughs> What was the first question again? I, I, I just posted it also in the okay. chat because it's a little lengthy. But mm -hmm. uh, so essentially, it's uh, asking about what other sort of forms of knowledge could be subsumed under the protection of intellectual property. I mean, is indigenous intellectual property in itself a separate sort of system of or something that deserves protection? I think so. I mean, I, you know, our, our stuff that we have out there is is very important, and it needs to be um, taken care of and make sure it's protected. You know, I think within the United States, you know, having us pass the um, Indian Arts and Crafts Act, just so that our designs and our um, music and uh, other things aren't stolen. So, but unfortunately, that's just here in the United States. That doesn't uh, take form in in, in Europe or, or wherever other people are looking at. Um, this information that's going out on the internet. If I may say this, who are the people interested in translating indigenous knowledge into the category of intellectual property? These are people who are not the rightful owners of this information. And I say this because the indigenous who own this information are mostly not literate. So the literate come on board, get this information and categorize it as trademarks, trade secrets, patents, get good patents out of it, and make good money out of it and ignore those who really own this information. Had it been that the indigenous were as knowledgeable as those who are not indigenous, then the categorization could have fallen for their own benefits. We shouldn't forget that those who make money out of these indigenous properties do this at their own advantage. They don't care. What other indigenous, well, categories could be there? I don't know this other category and i don't think the indigents are so interested to come up with another category reasons being that they are not sure that they will not be robbed because we have seen when you look at patents who are those taking patents out of these medicines are they the indigents no and because the indigents are of the opinion that they cannot get anything out of this they are now hiding the esoteric epistemology that they own and rightfully so because if we look at the western world there are certain epistemologies 
that is not revealed to people who are not in the core. Look, for example, the, the Freemasons. If you are not a party of the Freemasons, they don't tell you what happens in there. So for you to be able to know him there, you must belong. And since the indigenous know that there is an aspect that they can keep for themselves in perpetuity, they are refusing to open up. And hence, the secret epistemology is still being hidden to the public. That is the way I look at it. Look at the recent publication that I sent out last year in information development. I think I opened up a bit on that. But you should be looking at the four new new publications that are coming up. Yes. Right, right. Thank you, Charles. So, I mean, from, from what I understand, it, it seems that in intellectual property itself seems like a double-edged sword that it can be used to keep the knowledge from the people who generate it. And I, I was wondering, and I think it also ties into one of the questions that we've just received, uh, which is that, can you think of examples where communities themselves have used indigenous intellectual property to actually succeed in a legal claim? Uh, and the question that it ties to is, do speakers have ideas or reflection on how to move from extractive research to collaborative work? Uh, I have a recent example from uh, this small town uh, near Jaipur, which is called Bagru actually. Mm -hmm. uh, Bagru has been famous for uh, block printing tradition. Uh, and this tradition is uh, dated back to at least four, four, five hundred years back. So what happened recently that a, a trader, a textile trader, uh, got a trademark in name of the village. Now see, the trader is not from the village, he is from somewhere outside, but he has been selling the textile from the village. So he just got a Bagru as a trademark from our Indian government, which has a patent office, a copyright patent and trademark office, uh, comes under the Ministry of Commerce. So he got this, and then what happened that uh, these poor printers, uh, the, who has been doing these indigenous printings there for so long, uh, they had their firm name with something like Bagru Cotton Prints. So this guy has sued them actually. He has sent a legal notice to that uh, printer. And you can imagine the printers who are having a history of 400 years, their generations has been doing this first things long. That person, those those printer, this notice has gone not to one printer family, it has gone to three printer families. So we have raised this issue. We are fighting this uh, this issue. How can a person uh, trademark a whole village? So this is, I think, this is very much commercial oriented. All these uh, copyright or IPR issues, these are very much uh, commercial objective oriented. The, because the communities have never gone to to register themselves. Actually, they have never been aware that uh, they could be misused also by the outside world also. Similar case has been uh, uh, with one of the tribal community in South India. Uh, uh, that's a, they do a wonderful Toda embroidery. So that has been imitated in screen print, see, and it is being sold in the market by the brands as a Toda embroidery. So they have also filed a case recently. So this is happening re in a recent period when these communities has become educated. They know how to take legal options. Otherwise, uh, Many people has patented or trademarked many things. We do not even know about it. Then. Like we had an issue of Neem like in India. You know about that. And the Indian government fought that case also. Because we have been using it since long in our medicine system. But then it was taken, that patent has been taken away by America. So there, there are issues like, the, like that that we go through. Right, thank you. And uh, while we have you on screen, so I was also wondering if you could address the question on uh, how researchers in themselves think of making their work collaborative rather than extractive, because you did mention a little bit about sharing the output of your research. Yes, it is very important. Like, for example, myself, I have only seen things as an observer because when you document something, you know, even you have to give away your rational mind also. You know? 
because there are things there are many religious practice that happens you may feel that they are superstitions or they, so one has to keep the rational mind aside has to work with the community has to value them properly has to look into their practices more carefully and then i have been distributing because this material belongs to the community first of all this is the first they have the authority first so i cannot have any right like even if i am doing a book on it then it has it has i can only be mention myself as a uh, that i have collected these things from the community i cannot be author of that book i never mention myself as a author never a author of article also it has a contributors in it so those contributors come into the scene that this uh, this person has been the main singer these are the followers and these has been the uh, the music instrument players so i think that is very important because all these scholarly works or the academic work they cannot go to a individual person who is working with that tradition uh, it's a collaborative thing and it is our responsibility of the scholars that these materials should be returned to the community and whenever if any uh, if you are signing a document for copyrights then it that that uh, that copyright should always remain with the community but not even with the institute also it should always be with the community that is what i strongly believe in Right. Thank you so much. Uh, I was wondering if any of the other panelists had uh, anything to say on this. Well, I, I would just say that you know, working with other um, people in the academic area, um, I've done a, a documentary on a tribal nation here in Kansas, and you know, as an example to collaborate and, and work together. I did not, um, I gave that documentary back to that group and any whatever awards that were given for it um, when we were showing it, like I, I gave them all to the, to the tribe. So, you know, it wasn't my thing to go and, and make money off of it. Um, my only part was to be the recorder and record their stories and then give it back to them so that they had ownership of that documentary. And I think like when we talk about collaborating, that's what collaboration looks like. Because I didn't feel comfortable, even though I'm Native American, I didn't feel comfortable um, getting any anything out of it because that's not my tribe. Mm -hmm. Great, great, thank you. Uh, also, I mean, since we have you on screen, there is a question which I think uh, emerged when you were speaking. So. Uh, there's someone who asks, so who says that on vetting those claims to be indigenous artists, what form or process does it take? Or how can an indigenous artist be distinguished from those falsely claiming indigenous? Well, for here in the United States, um, so we have uh, federally recognized tribes that are recognized by the federal government. There's over 500 tribes on that list. So what people can do if they if they're looking to see if something is is real, um, they can look up that artist on uh, the internet and they can look up to see what tribe they're claiming. So usually for a native person, uh, when somebody asks you know what tribe you are, I'm Aqua Pueblo, we know exactly um, you know those tribes and 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 we can understand it. But you know I know for a non-native person they don't know all those tribes. So I would suggest you know looking up their background. Um, looking where they're claiming from, and then um, you know making sure that they are a member of that tribe. You know that they're in, they're um, you know in in that tribe, and so and most tribes do have their own website. So um, you know questions can be asked from them as well. And each tribe is different um, in you know determining who is a tribal member. Um, every one of us has a different um, way of doing that. So. Again, that you know, you have to go and just kind of do a little bit of research um, to find those things out. And then, if they think something uh, is fraudulent or is, is a fraud, they can report that to the department, um, to the federal government, and they have a form uh, from the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. If you just Google that, you can fill out the form and and, and make that claim. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Rhonda. Uh, so, I, I was wondering if any of the panelists had any closing remarks. Sure, I just should say, you know, 
Um, don't, <laughs> don't misappropriate the interculture. Uh, it's great. You know, we want to sell our art to people. There are tons of Native Americans, especially during this pandemic, that are making tons of art and they're selling it. And so there's great ways to find that on Etsy, on the internet, um, especially on Twitter. I, I retweet a lot of artists that are selling their stuff. Um, so, you know, we want people to buy it. We just don't want people to uh, culturally appropriate it as their own and start making it as their own. Thank you. So I've also just shared the links to all of the speakers and the work that they've been doing in their own respective fields. So please, if you are listening, do check those out because I'm, I'm sure you'll find a lot of more in the data as well. Uh, right. So would any of the other speakers want to say uh, a very short sort of closing piece. I think Chad, this was a wonderful platform that you gave, uh, bringing in contact with Charles and wonderful hearing to to Rhonda. Thank you very much for organizing such a wonderful event, and thank you once again. Thank you very much. All right. Th thank you so much, uh, Mother. So uh, we are just sharing a list of our social media sort of handles. So please do follow the Indigenous Studies discussion group to keep updated as to like what events and activities are. But I wanted to say uh, thank you to all of the panelists who took their time uh, out of their busy days and particularly during this incredibly, incredibly difficult time and managing all the different time zones to sort of suit uh, to UK time. So thank you so much for coming and sharing your lived experience and also like experience that emerges out of the research that you've spent so many years dedicating your lives to. So from the Indigenous Studies discussion group, uh, a big sort of virtual round of applause and thank you so much. Uh, this will be available as soon as the broadcast ends uh, on the same link uh, that that you signed in to view this. So, if I guess there's nothing further, uh, I wish that you have a great remainder of the day. And thank you so much for joining in. And it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.